And I have a cold today, so I'm sorry, I will try to speak clear, but <coughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about um, the city wall in Njelodase. Uh, and uh, Njelodase lies in what is today's old town of Gothenburg. But it was a town that existed even before Gothenburg even was thought of. So the town of Njelodase was established in 1473 when a group of Swedish noblemen were commissioned by the Privy Council, Stan Studer the Elder, to go to this new site and oversee the planning of the new town close to our very small coast during this period. Um, it's, I have a map that says in Swedish, but it's um, Norway and Denmark, so but the small part in the middle was the only thing that belonged to Sweden this time. And uh, the area which the town was founded on had previously been used by a nearby hamlet for pasture and meadow. So the new town was built on both sides uh, of the Sava stream. And what we don't have from this period, compared to a lot of you other speakers, uh, we don't have any historical maps from this time. So we don't know the city planning, we don't know how the fortification looked like. Um, we didn't know that much. Hardcore archaeology. Yeah. <laughs> we also work with the, we are different companies working together um, and doing um, contract archaeology or rescue archaeology in the middle of the city. Um, so this was very exciting and new for us. Um, just briefly about the his history, I'm not going to take the entire historical perspective here because we don't have time. But during the 1490s, the Nyaladasa was, um, along with Sardeshavn and Kalmar, described as the biggest shipping ports in Sweden. And also Nyaladasa was described as one of the largest towns in Sweden, along with Stockholm, Olbuturku and Sardeshavn. Um, the town existed only about 150 years, but it was characterized during its few years of many battles and difficulties. Around 1520s, King Gustav Vasa starts his way to power in Sweden, and he was aiming to rebuild Njolodasa for trading on the western seacoast. And finally, in 1624, it was ordered that all the population in Jalalase were to move into the new town of Gothenburg that was um, recently built up. <coughs> Twice before, in 1910 and in 1960s, archaeological excavations were conducted in the area, but mainly in the no northern parts here. The southern parts were not many hardly ever excavated. Um, <clears throat> in the 1910s, Sixten Strömbom discovered um, part of the mount in the north, here about and here. And in the um, reports, it was described that the mount was close to 20 meters wide and 2 meters deep. <coughs> The rampart consisted of natural silt and was reinforced with a stone facing on the rampart's other edge. In the 2011, a minor excavation was conducted on the south side of the town, here. And this is where we come in. So we, in 2015, had the opportunity to do a much larger excavation on the southern part. And what we had to go by, our map is from 1682, where we can kind of guess the moat here from the old town. <clears throat> so underneath all the modern disturbances and all the 18-1900s um, debris, we uncovered following remains, which is a palisade, um, what is left of the rampart, 
the mount um, abatis or storm poles, I don't know what to call them, so I just say both, uh, gatehouse and the bridge foundation. <coughs> so this is the modern construction from the 18, no. 19, yeah, but this is um, from the 11th side. <coughs> you can take the next picture. Um, this is just to clear up the area, what is, uh, what belongs to the 1500s period. Um, and we see the abatis on the stone poles here, the mount, what we think is a courthouse, um, and the palisade and the park. And I'm conflicting there with the stone from the mount. And uh, underneath that wooden fundament of the bridge or crossing the moon. Yeah. Yeah. So the rampart here's a photoshopped picture where we took away all the 18 and 1900s <laughs> holes. And this is the 18 and 1900 holes. We just photoshopped them off the picture so we can just easily see the moat. And it goes upwards here, where the uh, abatis are, and the rampart. Yeah. The rampart consisted of um, fine natural silt that was really hard packed. Uh, not much remained, but we could guess um, part of the rampart. And underneath, so we had the palisade, which consisted of three upward standing <coughs> beams, three logs side by side, really tight that uh, formed a wall. The beams were about 50 centimeters wide each and up to two to three meters uh, high. Uh, we took a lot of samples to Dendrook chronology datings and uh, 11 samples, which were almost half of our samples, were dated to 1528 to 1529. The moat, was about 10 meters wide from the rampart to the storm poles and about half meters deep, not so deep at all. Um, and in the moat we also had a huge amount of waste material that we will come back to. Is that it? The abatis or the storm poles um, consisted of beams fairly close to each other but they were angled towards the uh, uh, outer side, to the southern side, and the upper edge of the beams were sharpened. <coughs> I don't know if you can see. <coughs> we also have the gatehouse that had a robust construction, um, and what seems to be um, at least two sections or two rooms, we believe. But this area, it was very hard to excavate because we had the um, limit on how far we can excavate. So we may we only excavated maybe 20% of the probably gatehouse or pole house. So we don't really know what it is, but it, it is a, a construction of one or two rooms. That was a um, very robust construction. Um, and uh, we did date two, or, yeah, two samples um, which came back to the end of the 1400s. So that's the early stage of the Tower. Is it uh, 1414 or Dendro? No, Dendro. Yeah, and it was oak, mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, while the rampart was 1520s, which is King Gustav Wasser's time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you can see here at the edge that we had to stop here. We couldn't excavate further, and the rooms were like going into the wall. So we had the difficulties with the modern construction going on at the same time, and um, had to do our best. <laughs> this was put up so the land wouldn't move too much because there's a train station close by, so and our rampart was going like this, so it's cut through right through our uh, archaeological remains. 
So it wasn't an easy area, and it was also a very poisonous area. So half of the times we had to work with gas masks in June, where it was 30 degrees. So it was horrible sometimes, but it was very fun. Yeah. yeah. This is another sketch, a uh, photo of the beams underneath the gatehouse. Um, so what else, really, we're not looking at the nation as the defense of war, we're looking at the fortification as the purpose of the town, for the people. What did it mean for the people? Well, of course it was a city. <coughs> um, and in the area we have a really wetland uh, place. So uh, the boundary maker and geographical control limit and economic limits are being set out for the people in, in this wetland uh, southwest of Nyalagasa. Uh, economic limits, of, of course, taxes have to be paid, get in and trade inside this town. Uh, import and export were controlled. And also, uh, we're talking about this now city limit expansion uh, in a wetland, so the boat, of course, controlled the water that came in from the Yeta River. Uh, we talk about the, what did the moat and the palace make for the people then? And we looked at the, the uh, small amount of context uh, compared to your context with the uh, uh, city walls <coughs> like 10 meters wide. But we're looking at the context that we found in the moat and so on. And <coughs> of course, uh, first of all, it meant a whole lot of work building the thing for the people in the area, as even Gustavasa said, do this. And um, together with this order, new people came to the area so with craftsmen and their family. Uh, and that was also a kind of international contact, not only for the work in the city, but also the shipping and uh, the trades that were seeking the place into the area so also made people inside the town having international contacts. Some sort of social control were also, of course, uh, marked by the city limit when people were banned from the, from the city, not uh, if they were not keeping up with the rules. Waste and garbage control, of course, that we found a lot of. Um, and smaller traders and family businesses were found as well in the moat because we found bundles of flux being wet before handled in the, uh, by the carpenters as well. Mm. So, um, we really like to see the people, of we and them, what did, the, what did the city limit mean for the people inside and outside the, the border? And that is really what we like, like to look at. Yeah. Uh, not most of, uh, not as much as the defense of the mountain of the city because it was ruined over and over again. The town was attacked several times by the Danes and the, the, the city wall wasn't for protection really, what we could see. Um, so We more looked at it, the economic and geographical yeah. issue of it. But we also have to remember that we only excavated very few parts of the moats and the ramparts. Um, few um, trenches. trenches, thank you. <laughs> few trenches were carried out in the north, and then we carry out this in the south. So there's lots of um, archaeology, hopefully, that remains. Uh, the problem is that uh, the old town of Gothenburg is still being used with the buildings still standing, and we'll see if we in the future can ex excavate more areas. Hopefully we can, but um, this is what we have come come to so far. So. That's it. Yeah.